Hey guys, well as most of you know, uh, last night in Lafayette, Louisiana, there was a shooting in a movie theater there where a couple people lost their lives, several others were injured, terrified an awful lot of people and has film fans all over the country, maybe all, even all over the world, scratching their heads and feeling a little bit of sorrow. The movies are a magical experience where we go to leave the real world behind a little bit. We go to immerse ourselves in the fantasy of a different reality up on the screen. We go with our friends, with our loved ones, maybe some new people we've just met. We form bonds over shared experiences. And it's just one of those things that is meant to help us escape from reality and not be faced with the brutal reality of it sometimes. Our hearts and thoughts and prayers go out to everybody in the city of Lafayette, Louisiana, the people who were affected, the people who witnessed it, and the people who are being affected by it all over the world, really. But we don't forget that the movies are still a magic thing. They're still something that we turn our eyes to, we turn our minds to, we turn our imaginations to. Let's not allow the horrific events and the horrific deeds of a couple of maniacs, quite frankly, deter us from being film fans, deter us from holding on to that part of our culture where we all go out and experience these films, these movies, these pieces of magic all together. Our thoughts once again go out to the people in Lafayette. Now let's get on with movie talk. Hey everybody, happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Sinead DeFries and this is The Daily Show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is your Collider Movie Talk crew. First up, senior producer John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California. And we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here is Nerdist correspondent Miss Clark Wolf. Hey everybody, thank you all so much for having me guys. Thank you for being here, Clark. And Christian Harloff. I am going to give you a love it. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just a couple of days ago, Jurassic World became the third highest grossing film worldwide of all time, surpassing the first Marvel Avengers movie. To celebrate, Universal Pictures and Amblin Entertainment have officially announced the sequel to Jurassic World and a release date for June 22, 2018. Jurassic World stars Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard will return to reprise their roles from the first film. Jurassic World director Colin Trevorrow and Derek Connolly will be writing the script for the new film with no official word yet if he or another person will direct the project. John, is summer of 2018 the right time for a new Jurassic World movie, and do you like the idea of the key cast returning? I think a 2017 release could have been possible, but 2018 is well, look, as long as you're within three years, that's that's accepted. If they waited till 19, 20, then you'll be getting into not striking quick enough. I think 18 will be a fine uh, thing for that. Chris Pratt needs to come back. Number one, because he's a big star, but also for the story. He's the guy that Jurassic World had brought in because he could be an expert on these animals, he's trained with these animals. So having that character carry over into the next film completely makes sense. I'm not sure why Bryce Dallas Howard needs to be back. I'm a huge Bryce Dallas Howard fan, but her character is a businesswoman she doesn't need to be there. Then again, I haven't read the script, so maybe maybe she will be completely integral to the story. But uh, yeah, this sounds good to me. I'm excited about it. I really enjoyed this first one. I am still floored by the box office results of it. Absolutely floored, especially when you consider that the critic ratings were good, but not great. The audience ratings were very good, but not great. And yet it just kept rolling and kept rolling and kept rolling and now the third highest grossing film of all time it's incredible anyway clark what about you do you think 2018 is the right time and what do you think about the returning cast i think it's a fine time why not why not uh, I, I agree with what you said in terms of the timing yeah i mean sure it's you know it's i don't think that they're gonna frankly i don't think that anybody saw this box office coming Nobody and did. i don't think that waiting three years would you know um would will have a direct impact on any sort of sequel box office um, with that being said, I agree with you. I'm glad Chris Pratt is coming back. I will watch Chris Pratt do anything, quite frankly. <laughs> you could read the phone book, and I'm in. Um, you know, what was interesting, though, is to me, the chemistry between uh, him and Bryce Dallas Howard was always a little weird. It didn't quite click for me. And so, um, so I don't know what they're going to do together for 
another two hours. Um, but I guess we'll find out. I guess we'll see. Jurassic World, frankly, was I was underwhelmed, um, and and so I'm I, I'm not necessarily that excited for a second movie. But here's hoping that the crew who was involved with the first, who was involved in the second, learned from you know maybe some of the things that they could do better in the second movie, and maybe they'll tell a more coherent story or or whatever but it'll still be action-packed and exciting so i'm excited to see chris pratt come back and and speak to the dinosaurs you do bring up the, i did enjoy the film i liked it i had fun with it but you do bring up one of the big weaknesses of it is that i never believed the chemistry between chris pratt and bryce dallas howard like at all even though i think no. chris is really good in the movie i think bryce howard's really good in the movie on their own yep. but that chemistry i never they're both hot but they're great. That's, that's well, sometimes that's all the chemistry you need. And also, <laughs> I mean, to that point, you know, I really enjoyed Bryce Dallas Howard when she was kind of being her business lady role. Like I liked her when she was on her own. I liked her when she was kind of holding down the fort when she was trying to make things happen. But again, when the two of them got together, it just kind of felt like, what is this? Yeah, it didn't quite work. Well, Christian, what do you think? Uh, I thought it's inevitable that this thing was going to get a sequel. I mean, oh sure, obviously. Yeah. Um, I think three years is perfect because. Guess what? The, the one before this one was 13, 14 years. So that works. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when you have a movie that makes this kind of money and you have a star like Chris Pratt right now, two to three years, I agree with you, John. If you go past three, you're kind of, I mean, that's why I think Godzilla pushing out 2037, when are the next one's coming? <laughs> um, it's, it's too much because you do lose, especially with all the big blockbuster content we're going to be getting over the next couple of years with all the Marvel and DC movies, it's going to be lost in the shuffle. So three years is about right. And it gives it the the creators, it gives people more time to develop it. I didn't necessarily think that the story had anywhere to go after this last mm -hmm. one, but with the whole military aspect, if right. they're going to go down that route, which is the only way I think they can go, um, then yeah, I think that a sequel could be cool if they do it the right way. I don't want to see another park get taken over. We're, we're past that story. Now, as far as Colin Trev uh, Trevorrow goes, I had the opportunity of speaking to him on Schmoes a few weeks back, and I had asked him point blank if he was going to direct the sequel. He doesn't seem to have an interest in directing. He absolutely wants to be involved. Directing more. this. Directing this. Yeah. Directing this. He doesn't, and he's been rumored for the Star Wars movie. He's mm -hmm. been rumored for some other things. Um, and so he just doesn't see, he, he wants to produce and obviously write, but I don't think he necessarily wants to direct. Now, a bag of money could change his opinion tomorrow. Um, oh sure. So, I, or maybe it already has. But as far as I know, he's not coming back. But you know, three years I think is actually a better time than two because two could be rushed. All right, what's next? As many of you know, a few weeks ago, the upcoming new King Kong movie, Kong Skull Island, hit a couple of setbacks when the film lost two of their stars, J.K. Simmons and Michael Keaton, after the production date was delayed, causing scheduling conflicts for both actors. However, according to a report in Deadline, Trainwreck and short-term 12 star Brie Larson and Academy Award-winning actor Russell Crowe are both being eyed for roles in the film to join Tom Hiddleston, who is still attached. Kong Skull Island is currently set for release in theaters on March 10th, 2017. Christian, would the addition of Larson and Crow be good be good additions to Kong? Absolutely. Although is is Larson replacing JK Simmons? <laughs> That's my question actually. Um, but I think it's it's more or less uh, the, the, just to let you know, hey, we're still getting some good quality actors here because I love Brie Larson right now. Anything she's doing, yeah. I love her. Um and Russell Crowe I just, like I told you yesterday, I just watched Water Diviner. Regardless of what I thought of the actual movie, he's always a powerful presence, that guy. So having him involved in this, it brings legitimacy and it brings it back after, because I was really upset when I heard both Keaton and Simmons dropped a few, like a month or two, whenever it was, they dropped out. And I was like, ah, I don't know if they, this, this might say something about the product. But then when you get these two actors, I go, okay, well, maybe it was scheduling or maybe they just didn't necessarily respond to this. But to get Larson, who's an up, up and coming and crushes it every time, and to get someone as strong as Russell Crowe, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, this is, it is unfortunate news, but it makes sense. I mean, they did announce they had to push back the, uh, the the shooting schedule a little bit. And when you understand working actors in Hollywood, especially the big successful ones, their schedules are so precise that you're pushing something off four weeks. Now that doesn't work for me because I got another commitment to blow out. So that's totally understandable. Brie Larson, I think, Number one, she is an incredibly gifted actress. Whenever she's in anything, she totally sells me on it. Where there's kind of loose, ridiculous comedy, where there's something more serious, she sells me. And look, and on a, on a purely male level, maybe top two or three hottest actresses working in things. She's tough. a dynamic combination of beauty and talent in one package. And 
I'm all for it. put her in that classy. Yeah, and yeah. and very classy. She she comes across as very classy yeah. that sort of way. There's almost a little bit of a Meryl Streep thing wow. to her a bit that I kind of sense. Anyway, now, I'm not comparing her as an actress to Meryl Streep. Let's not go there yet. Russell Crowe, to this day, I will contend this completely. Uh, a lot of people will talk in like uh, you know football terms. If the game's on the line and you have to win this game, who do you want as your quarterback? You got to win this game, right? To me, if I'm a filmmaker and I this movie, I'm going to make this movie, and I absolutely have to have the absolute best performance from not necessarily box office, but best performance from an actor I can possibly get. Who am I going with? Daniel Day Lewis, obviously. My number two pick is still Russell Crowe. Just don't it be is, on the phone there. <laughs> yeah, just, just don't can, be. Uh, can Daniel phone. Day Lewis please be in Skull Island? That, <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah, he is. He's playing. He's playing King Kong. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> he's getting into his yeah. right now. He's doing his method some procedure. Some climbing right some buildings now. in New York. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, seriously, Russell Crowe is still the guy that I go to. The dude can even play Jorel yeah. and make the movie compelling and make you want to watch it. Look, the guy has three Academy Award nominations for Best League Actor for uh, in, The Inside Man or Inside Job. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, uh, the one where he actually out. Acted Al Pacino. The insider. The insider. We actually outacted Al Pacino, right. which is a hard task. Uh, <laughs> then, of course, he won one for The Gladiator and he was nominated for Beautiful Mind. And I'm going to contend that in 2005, this is right in the area where everybody was sick to death of Russell Crowe. Mm -hmm. for, for many reasons that were his own damn fault, by the way. But everybody was sick to death of Russell Crowe in 2005. And that's when Cinderella Man yeah. came out. I love that. And I'm going to tell you, all due respect to. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman for Capote, for uh, Yael Queen Phoenix and Walk the Line, for Terrence Howard and uh, Hustle and Flow, for Dave, David Strathairn and Good Night and Good Luck. All due respect to all those guys, Russell Crowe should have won Best Actor that year. I, I'll just say that. And, and the very least should have been nominated, but everybody was really sick to death of his antics. And as I said before, that was his own damn fault. But uh, this guy is a guy we'll go to every time. Huge loss of J.K. Simmons and Michael Keaton. I was so looking forward to seeing these guys. But you're right. If you lose them, oh well, that's scheduling, that's Hollywood. Brie Larson, Russell Crowe, absolutely. Right. Yeah, this sounds great to me. Not Paulie Shore on Yahoo Series. <laughs> <laughs> that's a totally different movie. Uh, which I'm also curious yeah. to see. Um, so I, I'm super bummed out about the loss of, uh, especially of Michael Keaton. You know, Keaton's been one of my favorite actors for a long time. And uh, I've always felt like he could have been, uh, he's he's so comedically talented. He's also a great dramatic actor. And, uh, and I think he's been consistent for a long time. And yet, for some reason, the roles, the career part, Part, whatever didn't quite work out. That's fine. I would have loved to have seen him in a big blockbuster like this. Um, but anyway, moving on. Um, it's super cool to see that Brie Larson is joining the team. Like you guys said, she's hot right now in more ways than one. Um, but uh, with Russell Crowe, I'm excited to see Russell Crowe in this movie if he is playing some sort of evil genius or evil character. Or I want him to play the bad guy is what I'm saying. I want him to go a little nuts because when I show up for Skull Island, I don't necessarily need to see an Academy Award nominated performance. Right. <laughs> and also, I like the diversity in uh, in Crow. Crow is able to do a lot of different things. He is an incredible actor. Yeah. And I want to see something a little bit, I want to see a little uh, something a little bit nuts from him. So that's my hope for the movie. Um, and by the way, Tom Hiddleston is still on board. Yes. Right, exactly. Tom Hiddleston yes. I mean, Those is, three alone. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's my Brie Larson. Yeah. Hey, the, Tom. Hey. There is something cool to think about Keaton going, oh, is that a monkey back <laughs> 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 it's, I don't monkey over there. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Sinead's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Sinead, what do we got? Ever since a reboot of The Fantastic Four was announced, many fans and commentators have speculated that Fox may plan on an X-Men Fantastic Four shared cinematic universe. While a few hints have been dropped here and there, the studio and talent involved have been very quiet on the topic until now. X-Men Apocalypse director Brian Singer was recently asked about a shared universe in an interview with Yahoo Movies, and he said the following. Those ideas are in play. That would be a natural matchup because they're both ensemble films, and there is a natural mechanism by which to do it. It deals with time. That's all I'm going to say. Clark, after hearing Singer's comments, do you buy or sell that an X-Men Fantastic Four crossover is going to happen? Oh, I buy it. I definitely buy it because from what I can tell in terms of Fantastic Four, 
is anybody excited about this movie? Okay, John is excited. I'm actually quite excited. Uh, so that's good. <laughs> you are representing. Um, but I, basically, here's what I'm saying, is that um, when I see the fans and their reactions, I'm hearing about Suicide Squad. I'm hearing about Batman versus Superman. I'm hearing about Civil War. To me, this seems what the fan base is excited about. Or even, of course, X-Men Apocalypse. Like, what's coming up? Like, that's... but. I had to actually look up today when Fantastic Four was coming out, and it's coming out in two weeks. Yeah. So <laughs> what my point is, is that it does not surprise me that Brian Singer wants people to think, hey, and Fox wants people to think, hey, you know those movies that you guys really love, that you are super on board with? They're going to, yeah, you should check out Fantastic Four because that's going to that's gonna be important later. Um, so for me, perhaps that's a little bit cynical, but it sounds like a smart business decision so that you can hedge your Fantastic Four bets and as get people excited about X-Men a little bit more. There is no denying what the public perception is of the Fantastic Four. It's negative, and it has been from the get-go. I, last year, was very negative about it, but they have won me over. I mean, it, it bears repeating. They brought on a director I really like. They brought on a writer I really like. They brought an entire cast that I really like. And I've really enjoyed the trailers up to this point. None of that means the movie will be good, but I actually have some high hopes and some high expectations. I also buy that this is actually going to happen. And I find these comments encouraging because if Fox thought they had a dud on their hands right now, they'd still release it Put as, get as much marketing as they can, get as big of an opening weekend as you can, and then wait for the bad word of mouth to come out, and then just collect as much back as you can on your investment. To me, this kind of suggests, since they already know how the movie turned out, mm -hmm. they apparently haven't sent out a gag order to anybody at Fox about, don't talk about Fantastic Four or whatever. They haven't said, let's separate Fantastic Four from X-Men. Brian Singer's coming out, and the very fact that, that Brian Singer said... That's all I can say about it right now. Mm -hmm. That tells me they're not just thinking about it. That means they've actually got their plan when he says something like that. So if they've already got their plan and Fox isn't telling them to X nay on the Antastic Four stuff, <laughs> then to me that sounds encouraging. So I'm still holding out hope and I do buy they're going to cross these universes. I'm going to sell it. Um, I do agree with almost everything that you guys have said so far. And this has been rumored for a long time that this was going to happen. I'm going to sell it until the two weeks when the movie comes out. Because sure. Yeah. It's, it's just because of box office return. It's really what it's all about. Because if the fan, because I don't care what critics are going to say about it, the fans are going to go either see it mm -hmm. or not see it. And if the fans respond to it, then I'll come back and go, you know what? I should have bought that. Because if the fans respond to it, it does well, and they want to see these actors and this universe play up into another one of their favorite universes, then yeah. So I buy that they're talking about it, and I also buy the fact they're sitting on, let's just see how it does in two weeks, and then we can keep talking about it. Because if it does well, then yeah, it's going to happen. I just... It's and it's not that I think the movie's going to stink. I just think because of everything that's been happening and how much how public it's been of the supposed rumors. It's public right. the public rumors <laughs> as far as uh, what tr what happened with Trank in the hotel room and how it was hard and the reshoots and all that. I hope that it comes out and it is awesome. And I mm -hmm. hope it's a surprise, kind of what Rise of the Planet of the Apes was in August totally. yeah, in 2011. Yes. That's what I want Fantastic Four to be. Um, but yeah, I, I, for now, I got to sell it. Do you think superhero fatigue is going to play into this? No, and I don't think that Ant-Man had superhero fatigue. I, oh, I, 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 I didn't either. get a chance to talk about it in movie talk. That someone, well, Ant-Man only made 58. It was a small movie I'm, that yeah. should have made that money. Uh, yeah. and, and that was projected at 60. Exactly. I picked it at 65. Yes. so It I, did no, exactly what we thought it was going to do. There's no fatigue right now. But I don't think fatigue's going to play into whether now that doesn't mean that it's going to do well. Right. It's because you put if if it was a Mar if it was a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie that was coming out right now with Fantastic Four, mm -hmm. it'd probably have a much better chance. Sure. Um, and and it's still carrying the stink of Tim's story. That is a not a small point you just yeah. made. We are still close enough to the other Tim Story yeah, Fantastic definitely. Four disasters <laughs> that that is one of the uphill. No, let's face that is the uphill battle yeah. that they're fighting. Is that a lot of people still, despite the fact that this is these are completely new producers, new director, new writer, new cast, new story, doesn't matter to a lot of people. We remember the Fantastic yeah. Four movies and they sucked, I, and that's what people are thinking. I had about a conversation right now. with a casual movie fan about a week ago, and like, they're like, oh, do you have to do another uh, Fantastic Four movie? They just did that terrible one with with Jessica. Alba and everyone that's the first thing this girl yeah. said and it's just casual movie fans like I'm not gonna see that I'm like have you seen the trailers like I didn't need to all I was thinking about those other movies were so terrible it's you know, the, we have our nose in this thing. We 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 know who. Not a lot of people know who Josh Trank is. Casual movie fan. They may or may not have seen Chronicle. We all do. Our we, we know Kinberg. 
it's going to be a hard sell. I'm it's very curious. It's an uphill battle. Yeah. But I think because it's an uphill battle, I think the people at Fox are smart enough to know that. And I think they know, look, Fantastic Four doesn't need to have a $100 million opening. What we need this film to do is not be a big blockbuster success, although that would be wonderful for them. We need this film to change the perception of the Fantastic right. Four. Yeah. If it comes out, makes $30 million opening weekend, but people respond mm -hmm. to it and the critics like it and they've changed the game, yeah. they'll keep moving forward with stuff. Yeah. But that's a big if. Yeah. All right, what's next? On yesterday's Collider Movie Talk, we reported that Dwayne The Rock Johnson has just landed a director for his upcoming Rampage film. <laughs> Today, we get to report that the Rock, the Rock has a new director for yet another one of his upcoming films, Baywatch. According to a report in Variety, Horrible Bosses and King of Kong director Seth Gordon will helm the new remake of the David Hasselhoff television series. Dwayne Johnson tweeted the following last year when he first announced his attachment to the project. This is my beach, bitch. Rumors are true. We're making hashtag Baywatch the movie. Edgy, raunchy, and hopefully funny as all hell. Cue slow-mo running on the beach. Hashtag who needs mouth to mouth. Hashtag red shorts be hugging a brother. John, buy or sell Seth Gordon directing The Rock in a Baywatch movie. I buy this. And the, here's why I buy this. This is a couple of small points first. Number one, I really like Seth Gordon. I, I'm, I'm a big fan more than most people of the original Horrible Bosses. And my goodness, folks, if you have not seen King of Kong, it is one of the most fascinating documentaries I've seen in the last like 15 years over such an unimportant, yeah. tiny subject. <laughs> and yet he finds a way as a storyteller to totally make you feel like it's life and death. And this is like global, pol socio-political changing landscapes kind of stuff. It's amazing what he did with that. The other thing, this is the main thing that makes me excited about it. From the tweet that The Rock put out, they are clearly not making a movie version of the television series. It sounds raunchy, comedy, blah, blah. They are gonna go just balls to the wall ridiculous on this. Literally. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> And we were talking about before, and it's, it's like, this sounds more like, I, I cannot remember the name of them. What was, there was a bunch of porn parodies of Baywatch went out there, but it, that became like huge in the, across the globe. But I, it, this sounds more like a parody of that than it does of the actual TV show. And if they go totally ridiculous, you got a personality like The Rock in there, they embrace the nonsense of it, Seth Gordon directing it, and I saw what he did with Horrible Bosses. Yeah, I'll give him a pass on Horrible Bosses too. Um, then this could be really awful, or it could be really kind of good. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed for good, so for now I'm going to buy it. Clark, what about you? Oh, I buy it. Oh, I buy yeah. it all really? the way. That, that shocks me. I'm oh, so excited really? to buy this. Oh, yes. listen, I love The Rock. I love The Rock. I will watch The Rock do, again, like uh, like we've mentioned earlier today with uh, Chris Pratt, I will watch The Rock read the phone book. So, And The Rock is funny. He is so funny. And so I love the idea of him in a Baywatch. In fact, and this is going to sound really silly, but just I'm not making this up. Like last week, I thought to myself, hey, what's going on with that Baywatch remake? Is that actually <laughs> happening? I swear to you. And I thought to myself, if only uh, uh, Miller and Lord were available. But if they oh, can, I mean, how good would it be, right? Yeah. But if they, I understand they got to do that Han Solo thing. But right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I what I'm getting at is if they can, with this production, embrace that that energy or, or try and replicate what 21 Jump Street did, say, for right. instance, and just have fun with it and make a, a broad, fun, funny comedy on this ridiculous premise, then I think we have a big winner. And again, if The Rock is in it, I'm I'm on board. Christian. Yeah, I'd buy it. When I was when I was reading <laughs> I thought I was gonna be the only one to no, buy this. No way. Sorry, and, I did. and it's the same reason for, for both you taking points of Clark's, taking points of yours, is the Seth Gordon I'm a big fan of, even though definitely don't like horrible horrible bosses too. And one I thought was okay, but I still I love what he did with Kings of Kong. Um, and I think when you work with someone like The Rock, like Clark was saying, who just is a natural. He's a natural, and his, yeah. his, his he's got that comedic gene. We talked about him on Saturday Night Live. He's what he so does. great yeah. on Saturday Every Night Live. Every time he's on, he crushes it. And it was the tweet that won me over because <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, yeah, I, yeah, all right, I can see. <laughs> the tweet is key. It's, it's it, when it is because it's, it's the details. Because when you initially see Baywatch, you're like, oh come on, what? Oh, that's what you're gonna do with it. Okay, well then that there are certain shows that when they take like there was one point when Jim Carrey was gonna do uh, the Million Dollar Man, mm. and they were gonna turn it into like a goofy, silly comedy, and that ultimately didn't work, and they scrapped the whole thing. I was glad they scrapped it because I didn't want to see that particular show turned into a spoofy comedy. And a team that kind of mixed it in the middle. 
this is one of those remakes that is calling for a spoof version of it and a silly, raunchy version of it. And with The Rock in there, yes, the raunchy comedy, because he, it's, it's also, I think a week ago, we talked about how he changes his game every time he goes out there. Yeah, he'll he do does. something like mm-hmm. Snitch, and then he'll do something like Pain and Gain, and then he'll, you know, then he does the Rampage, and now he's doing a spoof comedy. He's making all the right moves in his career. He's not stuck in the Tooth Fairy land anymore. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, huge buy for me. I want to watch him. Do this type of movie. I want to see what Seth Gordon can do with this, and I want to see what that collaboration's like. So yeah, it's a huge buy. You know, a lot of people talk about The Rock on Saturday Night Live, and, for, and a lot of people's favorite skits of his is The Rock Obama, yeah. which is good. But my all-time favorite, can I guess, take guess, Mr. Peepers. No, oh really? That's no, so good. Is, but I think it might it might have been his first appearance on Saturday Night Live. Maybe it was the second. But the Nicotrell skit. I don't know if you oh, remember. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. those of you who haven't seen the Nicotrell skit, it's like a fake commercial for uh, a product because, you know, the, the products to help you stop smoking are big. And it's his husband and wife going, man, I'm just having a hard time quit smoking. Don't worry, honey. I got you Nicotrell. What's Nicotrell? And then the rock breaks through the wall. <laughs> I'm Nicotrell. And basically he kicks the crap out of you if you ever start to smoke. Can he rip the guy's arms off? Yes. Yeah, something <laughs> ridiculous. It is so ludicrous. But his good. opening monologue, too. I remember the one where he sang and danced yeah. and was yeah. and crushed it. And I was like, man. He Fran- should just yeah. do anything. Franchise Viagra. Yes, yeah. franchise, franchise don't get me, Viagra. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> I I quoted, I coined Franchise Viagra. You really like did. I remember that You day. were on that, and then like four weeks later, he's really? on Saturday Night Live and says, I'm Franchise Viagra. And I got all these people tweeting me, wow. John, The Rock just said he's Franchise Viagra. I'm like, damn, you rock. Saturday Night Live <laughs> stole a bit. What? Saturday <laughs> stole yeah, a bit from Movie shocks. Talk. All right, what's next? As most of you know, a sequel to last year's hit comedy, Neighbors, is already in the works and is currently scheduled for a May 13th, 2016 release date. Now, according to a report in Variety, Kick-Ass and the Equalizer star, Chloe Moretz, is in talks to join the film alongside returning stars Seth Rogen, Rose Byrne, and Zac Efron. The original film made over $268 million worldwide on a reported $18 million shooting budget. Christian, do you buy or sell Chloe Moretz joining Neighbors 2? Yeah, I buy Chloe Moretz joining for sure. I mean, I think she's going to be uh, a lot of fun. I don't necessarily buy Neighbors 2. I understand why they made it in for the stats that Sinead just gave. Um, I didn't love Neighbors as much as, as like you did, John, and other people did, but um, I understand why you have to make a sequel. But as far as Chloe Moretz, I just automatically think of her in Kick-Ass and what she was able to do yeah. in Kick-Ass and what she, I can already see her. She'll probably be the wise. She'll be probably, I think, the Zac Efron role from Neighbors One to maybe even Zac Efron and Seth Rogen together this time. Right. Maybe she's the one who's the who's the pain in the ass, and now it's a bunch of sorority girls who are the ones, which I would assume is going to be the premise. So, and she's, I think, she, because what that movie did for me was show a big range for Zac Efron. And what we were just talking about with The Rock with range and the way that The Rock can show comedy, Zac Efron showed me a side that I didn't know that he had. Yeah. And I want to, I've seen a little bit of that from Chloe Moretz, but I'd love to see more, so it's a buy. I was, as you mentioned, I was a big fan of Neighbors. Not as big as Schnepp was, though. Like, really? Schnepp, Schnepp lost his, I, he, gave a, he gave it a 10. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know that I've ever seen him give a 10 before, but to Neighbors, <laughs> wow. he gave it a, a perfect 10. Yeah, as soon as I saw Chloe's name in this, it's like, Oh, the new the next door house is going to be taken over by a sorority yeah, now. Yeah. Um, we saw at the end of Neighbors that Zac Efron and Seth Rogen became friends, so Zac Efron is going to move into the basement apartment, probably of their house, and he's going to be living with them now. The big question I have, and I buy this, I, I do want to see a sequel, both because I thought these characters were really funny, they had really funny chemistry together, and financially, when you make a movie for eighteen million dollars, you make two hundred sixty plus. I mean, then you kind of have to go for it. My big question is going to be an underrated player in Neighbors, which is Dave Franco. I thought actually Dave Franco was a really a really nice piece to that puzzle, off playing not only the rest of the cast, but also specifically with Efron. Mm-hmm. He set up Efron for a lot of his big shining moments as well. So I'd be really curious to see if he's coming. I'm not saying it's a must, but it would be really cool to see uh, him back as well. Not that you have to bring everybody back. But anyway, Clark, what do you think? Yeah, I'm with you guys. Um, so again, don't know if I buy Neighbors 2 in general. I don't know why we need it. But like we've all said, OK, we get why. Um, I am with you. I wrote down in my notes, Dave Franco, please. Yeah. <laughs> I, I loved Dave Franco in Neighbors. Um, but I like the talent in Neighbors. So what I wanted to say is, yes, Chloe makes perfect sense. And, um, and yeah, I assume as well that a sorority would be moving in next door, which leads me 
need to be excited about possible hijinks that Rose Byrne can get into. Yeah. Because if we'll remember from the first movie, she was part of the, she was the big driving force between playing that frat. And she kind of came up, her character came up with a lot of the ideas and actually executed them. And I would love to see Rose Byrne and Chloe Moretz and a potential sorority kind of pitted against one another or using their powers for good and evil. So um, I'm really excited for, for that potential collaboration. All right, what's next? According to The Hollywood Reporter, director Ridley Scott has signed on to direct the upcoming novel adaptation, The Cartel. The story is, is described as follows. DEA agent Art Keller has been fighting the war on drugs for 30 years in a blood feud against Adan Barrera, the head of Al Federacion, the world's most powerful cartel, and the man who brutally murdered Keller's partner. Finally, putting Barrera away cost Keller dearly, the woman he loves, the beliefs he cherishes, the life he wants to lead. Then Barrera gets out, determined to rebuild the empire that Keller shattered. Unwilling to live in a world with Barrera in it, Keller goes on a 10-year odyssey to take him down. His obsession is with justice, or is it revenge? Clark, buy or sell the sounds of the cartel with Ridley Scott at the helm. Sell. I, <laughs> I don't care about this at all. Not at all. Ridley Scott, go make Blade Runner. Please go make another Prometheus movie. Yes, I know people hate Prometheus, but I would rather see a exquisite mess than a boring one. And this just sounds like every single dumb thriller that I have heard of in this realm, in this world. The only thing that would make me slightly interested in this movie is who they cast in these roles. If they're gonna cast, I'm sorry to say, Leonardo DiCaprio or Russell Crowe, I don't care. I, I don't care, but are you gonna show me somebody like mm, Sam Rockwell or Idris Elba or, you know, show me exciting, interesting actors in these roles and maybe I could get excited, but at this point, it's just a, such a big, fat sell to me. Uh, I am going to sell it, even though I think it sounds awesome. <laughs> I do, I think the story sounds great and who seven years ago would ever think anybody would say this? Because it's Ridley Scott, I'm selling it. I mean, he has directed some of the great films of all time and nothing is ever going to change that. He has already secured his place in the pantheon of great directors. That's always going to be there. But let's face it, six out of the last seven movies he's directed have not been good. We're either talking about Exodus. And some people liked, liked Exodus, Gods and Kings. I, like many others, did not. The Counselor was terrible. I thought Prometheus was terrible. Robin Hood was terrible. Body of Lies was terrible. American Gangster was good. I liked American Gangster. Uh, a Good Year was terrible. I mean, it's just, it's gotten to that point now where it was like, okay, it's Ridley Scott, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. It's Ridley Scott, so it could be good to, it's Ridley Scott, I doubt it's gonna be good. I feel bad about that. Now, I'm, that could change after we see The Martian. Once The Martian comes out, if he's able to crush that, and I know most people didn't like the trailer, I did, personally. If it's really good, my enthusiasm for this will rise because I like the premise. But for now, sadly, I got to say I sell it. I'm sadly selling it as well, too. But I, 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 as you're saying that thing about The Martian, I'm like nodding my head. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. He was kind of brought in after what's his face had to leave. Um, didn't I forget who he wasn't originally slated to direct that, mm. and then Matt Damon brought him on. Matt Damon's been developing, so even if it's good, is you know, it, not that <laughs> not that Ridley Scott's not gonna have a lot to do that, he certainly will. But the ones that he's been developing on his own and kind of pushing forward there have been disappointing. And you're absolutely right, seven years ago, you hear about this premise and you're going, Yeah, now the first thing I think of, I hope it's not boring. Yeah. It, and like this movie should that should never come into my head. Because how good did the counselor that's I, sound? That's, that's the first how thought. Good did the that counselor movie was sound? the first thing that came up to me. Although I did enjoy Exodus. I know Dennis didn't. I know you didn't. But I I found myself you're not alone in that. But I I did enjoy it. Um, but it's it's still there's a different. He's good in that kind of big epic thing. And even with Prometheus, which I didn't enjoy, still looked beautiful. His movies still look really beautiful. Um, they you can watch some stuff and question logic sometimes um <laughs> but in regards to this yeah i'm just skeptical because these types of movies have tend to be boring lately from him but i hope that i'm 100 percent wrong and that we are raving about this movie after it comes yeah out. me too i hope so too all right folks we've come to the part of the show for a brand new segment here on fridays at movie talk box office predictions brought to you by our <laughs> friends over at amc theaters we are now going to take our shot here at trying to guess and predict what come monday the top five spots at the box office will be. So I will lead things off here. I will go first. Here's what I think is going to happen here. I love that graphic, by the way. 
All right. I think the box office champion come Monday is actually going to be Pixels. I think Pixels Ooh. will be the new box office champ. In number two, I believe, because, because even though, I look, I'm not a big fan of Pixels, to be honest. I saw it. I, I don't think it is the utter piece of toilet water on the bottom of your bathroom floor that I was <laughs> fearing it was going to be, but it's, I, I can't recommend it. But still, people drive out in droves to see Adam Sandler comedies no matter how bad they are. I think in the number two spot, I think Ant-Man will hold the number two spot due to positive word of mouth. I think the number three spot will be Minions. I think it will hold on to the number three spot. I think Southpaw will get as high as the number four spot. And I think Trainwreck will hang on to the top five. And I think Trainwreck will be at number five, bouncing out, inside out, and Jurassic World. <laughs> so that's my five. Pixels, Ant-Man, Minions, Southpaw, Trainwreck. Christian, you look like you're chomping at the bit today. <laughs> I got you beat here, buddy. Oh, my what's God. Your top you don't five even for have oh one of the movies God. that's going to be in the top three. Uh, number one is going to be Pixels. You're right. And I know we're not doing money here, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, I think just around $35 million, I think it'll be number one. I don't think it's a bad to guess. Um, but number two is Paper Towns. It's opening in more theaters than a lot of these movies. It had. Don't forget what Fault in Our Stars did. Um, this is a big audience, so Paper Towns will come in at number two. Three and four are toss-up. Three could be Ant-Man because of word of mouth, or it could be Minions um, because of the families. It's still really... It picks, they're very close they're during the Monday through Friday. so close. So, But right now, I'll go Ant-Man. We probably might regret that decision, but I'll go Ant-Man. Then I'll go Minions, and it pains me to say it. I don't think Southpaw's going to hit the five. I think Trainwreck will. We'll hang in there. So I think that we got Pixels, Paper Towns, Ant-Man, Minions, and Trainwreck. Oh, Clark. man. <laughs> Can I just say, by the way, that when they told me we had to do this today, I was like, well, I'm terrible at this. So this is good. I'm glad I'm on the inaugural one. Um, and I want to give a quick shout out to Vatican Tapes because it is opening in only 400-ish 400 400 theaters, yeah. theaters. And so it's a small release. As a horror fan, my friend Chris wrote it, which yay, Chris. But also, I will say for you horror fans out there, there is a little twist in there that I have never seen before for an exorcism mm. subgenre movie. So maybe check it out. Whatever. Okay. Top five. Oh my God, this is embarrassing. Okay, um, the first one. Uh, I'm going to go backwards, actually. I'm going to start at five. Okay. Uh, Southpaw. I think Southpaw is going to be uh, round out the top five. Number four, I think, is going to be Minions. Uh, number three, I think, is going to be Ant Man. Number two, I think, is going to be Paper Towns. But number one, number one, <laughs> I think, is going to be Trainwreck. Now, Train here's wreck. why. Here's why. <laughs> I know. Their, their faces are shocked. You, I know. But I'm, I'm pulling pixels out of there. And here's why. You don't think pixels are going to make top five? No. Wow. And here's why. I'm voting again. I'm, I'm betting against pixels. A, because of my faith in humanity. But secondly. <laughs> oh, that's your mistake number one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I think that, so Pixels is sort of being pitched as like, a, it's a kid's movie, right? Or it's a family movie, yeah? I think this summer we have seen a lot of really smart family movies. We've seen Minions, we've seen Inside Out, we've seen, I mean, even Ant-Man is, I think, an arguably a family movie. I think that Adam Sandler has burned a lot of bridges uh, publicly. I think he's got a lot of flack um, for some of the stuff that happened with his Netflix movie. I think the reviews for this movie have been terrible. And I think the audience, the big audience, might not bring their kids to see this movie. It, that, so, train, <laughs> what, what, what? I was going to say, remind me of like Tin Cup with Kevin Costner when he was doing so well. And he, was, <laughs> and he just junked it at the you end. You know I love Tin Cup. You know I love that so movie. So just recapping again, so your wait, top five. Here's why I want, I'm putting Trainwreck at number one. Here's why. Because I don't think that there's going to be, Trainwreck made what, 30, was it 30, 30. last weekend? Yep. I think that, that we're not going to see a huge drop off. Um, I don't think we're going to see a 50. So you I don't think, think any movie this week is going to make over $20 million? I think picks. I think Trainwreck might only. Well, no. Again, I'm terrible at this game. <laughs> I admittedly am terrible at this game. But I am just going to put my faith in good word of mouth mm. and uh, and and audiences who have heard good things about Trainwreck going out to see it. So maybe maybe it'll pull in twenty five. Uh, maybe. But I am betting against Adam Sandler this weekend. Well, here's the thing. You brought up Paper Towns. Well, both of you have it in at number two, Number right? two. Yeah. And I, I originally had it in my number three spot. I originally did. And then I sat back and I thought about it. And it's like, well, you know, The Fault in Our Stars, although nobody anticipated how big of a hit that was going to be, I remember Fault in Our Stars feeling a lot of buzz for the movie going into it. And they did do a significant marketing push on that. I started thinking about Paper Towns. And while I'm, I, I was going to see it last night and I didn't get a chance to, I'll probably see it later tonight. While I'm looking forward to it, I remember thinking, 
I have not seen nearly the same marketing push for this movie as I did for Safe Alternate Stars. That's true. And I haven't sensed that same buzz. Now, granted, this has the momentum of Fault in Our Stars going for yeah. it, but at the end, so I dropped it down a couple of spots, thought about some more, dropped it down a couple more, thought about it, and ended in my number six spot. So I hope you guys are right. Well, you know, it's also opening in more theaters That is exactly than what I was about to yeah. say, is that it is getting a big, big release. Yeah. And that's why, because I originally was like, will it even, like, you know, if it's 1,500 theaters, if it's whatever, will it even crack like the top 5? It's like 3,000. Yeah. They're really going yeah. hard for yeah. this. So I do think that it's going to I have high us. hopes for the movie, so I hope you guys are yeah. right. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email it in to collidervideo at gmail.com. So, Sinead, what's in our mailbag today? Jennifer writes, hello, all. I started watching your shows back in March, and I got hooked right away. Love all the shows and haven't missed an episode yet. My question to you is, what does retcon and red band mean? When I hear these terms being used, I get stuck trying to figure them out, but so far, no luck. <laughs> thanks for the amazing content and can't wait for more. Uh, thanks for the question, Jennifer. And you know what? Sometimes doing the show, traveling in the circles that we travel in and hanging around the circles of people that we hang out with, we sometimes for forget that we throw around a lot of jargon and, and some terms and maybe not everybody knows what right. these are talking about. So let's start with the simplest one, Red Band. Red Band refers to a trailer. Now you notice that when you see a trailer in a movie theater or even online, you first get that green screen that says, you know, uh, Motion Picture Association of America, blah, blah, blah. What the green signifies is that anybody can watch this trailer, that the Motion Picture Association of America has deemed that this trailer is cool for everybody to see. The next thing, like we have right here on the screen right here, is when a trailer is about to play, and instead of the green screen behind the lettering, it's a red screen. These are referred to as red band trailers. Generally speaking, these are for R-rated trailers. Not necessarily trailers to R-rated movies, but if a red band comes up before a trailer plays, you're about to either get some nudity, some sex, some f bombs, some decapitations, some are you're gonna see all on the same. All yeah, if we're, we're all lucky in <laughs> once. If if it's a good day, right. all the, so that type of content will be in the trailer you're about to see. So basically, if you go to see the Smurfs movie, they're not going to play a red band trailer before it. You usually only see a red band trailer, and you don't often see red band trailers in theaters at all. But sometimes they do, and usually those will only be playing in front of R-rated movies, so the it's already appropriate for the audience that's there. With retcon. Retcon has become sadly popular. Uh, retconning is basically the practice of this. Introducing something new in an ongoing story, like whether it's a television show or a movie series or whatever, that the introduction of this new fact or piece of information or whatever, I'm not going to say deletes your past understanding, but changes your perception of the story moving forward. So for instance, let's say you're watching uh, a, a movie and stuff like that. Here's a great one, Star Wars. I was just gonna say, yeah. Star Wars, right? Uh, spoiler alert, by the way. Uh, Star Wars, you have this perception going forward until you hit Empire Strikes Back when Darth Vader says, you know, up, up to now, the belief has been, you know, uh, Luke Skywalker, his father was killed by Darth Vader. Blah, that's the history of Star Wars. Well, they changed the history when Darth Vader says, I am your father. It retconned it. The, uh, the old television series, Dallas. There was an entire season where at the season finale, they re revealed... Actually, it was all a dream and just retconned the whole thing. The new Star Trek movies, right? By changing the timeline, all that kind of stuff, they, in essence, in a way, retconned all of the previous Star Trek stuff that we knew and understood. So that's kind of what they mean by retcon. How would you add to that definition? Well, I was going into the Star Wars thing, though, too, for as far as like when all those books came out that, that back in the day yeah. that they put together, and then once they added all the new books were coming out, were going to be actually part of the Star Wars history. All those books you knew before were retconned. They weren't part of They're the story gone. anymore. Yeah. As far as the Red Band go, I would love to see someone go, well, that's Smurf and Bull, Bull Smurf. That'd be, that'd be amazing uh, as far as a Red Band trailer. But yeah, it, for Red Band trailer, sometimes, not always, when there's a comedy, it usually means to watch the Red Band trailer if it's already, because that's really the tone of the movie that you're going to yes, feel. Yes, good point. And I think for me, the one that, that really signifies that is Spy. Because mm. when I saw the Spy trailer, the regular, the Green Band version, I was like, all right, but then when I saw the red band, I'm like, oh, that's the movie. It, right. And you know, you can't, you have to, there's certain audiences you can't show that trailer to. Yes, indeed. But it's also not the audience that's going to see your movie. So I think Vacation just had a, re a red band trailer. Oh, the movie should have no trailer. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, heavens. Well, 
I enjoyed the Red Man trailer for the Red Man trailer was great. I thought yeah, it was great. It was. And as a horror fan too, uh, horror and comedy, I I love seeing the Red Band trailers because it's like you said, Christian. You can get a um, well. Didn't Evil Dead, Evil Dead, the last Evil Dead movie had a crazy Red Band yeah, trailer, yeah. and that got like especially in the horror world, everybody that I knew was just like, oh my god, this is happening. It's so awesome. Um, at least I did. But anyway, <laughs> um, so so yeah, I'm always a fan of seeing the Red Band trailers because like you said, Christian, you know, if you're making a hard R movie in any respect to make a PG rated trailer for it doesn't necessarily always convey the essence of um, of, of what the story you're trying to tell. So I, I always get excited when I see Red Band trailers. Yeah, like the Wolf of Wall Street Red Band trailer was far more good reflective of the movie. And I just thought another great example of retconning. X-Men Days of Future Past. Totally. Oh, yeah. totally oh retcon so much yeah. of the X-Men yep. That's universe. like the definition yeah. of yeah. Yeah. retcon. That's all you yeah. should say when someone goes, what's retcon? X-Men Days of Future yep. Past. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah that's, that's what we should have led with. All right, folks, that will do it for this episode of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great movies are playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amc theaters for all of your theater, showtime, and of course, your movie ticket information. Don't forget, folks, even more importantly, subscribe to this YouTube channel, keeping you up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news and listen if you'd like breaking news in the world of movies some really great commentary make sure you bookmark the website collider.com crack staff over there keeping you up to date on everything going on in the world of movies and entertainment make sure you are bookmarked on that website I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, our very special guest, Clark Wolf. Clark, where can people find you online? They can find me on the Twitters and Instagrams at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E, and on YouTube, youtube.com slash official Clark Wolf. And thank you guys for having me. Sitting over here, the host of Jedi Council, did it all without me yesterday, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, <laughs> well, you were missed. You? you were missed, my friend. Uh, Twitter, definitely at Christian Harloff, and Periscope, Christian Harloff. But make sure, I, Instagram, very happy with the amount of people who've been following me there lately. Thank you so much. Pretty shocked on that. And then, and yes, Jedi Council. Make sure that you check out Collider Jedi Council and hashtag Collider Jedi Council. Get your questions on the air. We're looking at them all this week. For next week, where Obi John Kenobi will be back. <laughs> you do such a great job on that show, by the Thanks, way. Man. And speaking of doing a great job, always doing a great job, our one and only Ashley Mova could not be here today, but in her place, <laughs> she. <laughs> oh, we no. love. Hey, Wendy. <laughs> You guys stop laughing back there. We love Sine Dufresne. Oh. As always, the wonderful Sine Dufresne. Sine, where can people find you online? I'm on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> I'm back on Periscope as well, at Sinead DeFries, and I'm at ThatSoSinead.com, and I'll be kicking some butt in just a second as well. We love you. <laughs> and, of course, you can follow me on the various social media networks just uh, on Facebook or on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for Collider Video, and until next time, bye-bye.